Hello everybody, uh, it's been a couple weeks since my last video and I wanted to reply uh, roughly to a comment that was posted on my latest video, The Hypothetical Origins of the State. Uh, this is by a longtime subscriber by the name of Holistic John. Uh, he sent me a lot of messages over the past. Uh, I don't know how much that we've really talked before, but if we haven't, you know, hello, Holistic John. Um, and, you know, in his comment, which, you know, he said he agreed with a lot of the things, he brought up a very common point, and that is that in his view, uh, you know, a state would have a certain advantages, definite advantages over uh, anarcho-capitalism. And this is why he doesn't identify as an anarcho-capitalist, um, because he thinks when it comes to things like defense, states are, he doesn't say necessary. So he's not making the weaker argument that, well, absent a state, you can't have this service, but that it provides the service better than anarcho-capitalism, that anarcho-capitalism, while it might produce defense and certainly would produce defense, produces it suboptimally or even more importantly, uh, less less well than a state would do. Uh, and I think this is a really important question. That's not one that I haven't addressed before or others haven't addressed. Uh, it's, I think, I'll, I'll, the cliche is people ask about the roads and maybe healthcare, but I do think this is the hard question that most people will concede things like, yes, schools and healthcare, and probably roads, there's probably market solutions to this. This is probably, along with law, the, the two that people have the hardest time really envisioning or accepting that these could be A, provided at all, uh, or B, provided in a more satisfactory way than they can be or are currently provided by the state. Uh, now, bear in mind, all those are different questions requiring different burdens of proof. And one trick involved in just having these discussions is that it's often very difficult uh, by addressing one aspect of that, you don't address all of them. So I could very easily prove, for instance, that uh, defense would still exist absent the state, and then you could always retort, ah, uh -uh, but I'm not just worried that it doesn't won't produce any, I'm worried that it won't produce as much as the state can. Um, and then there's the how much the state hypothetically can and how much the state actually does. And these are all slightly different questions that have uh, different uh, logic change and empirical tests that would lead to reaching conclusions. So it's kind of hard to to comprehensively do it. And I don't claim that this video is going to comprehensively answer all those questions, but it, it is an interesting one, so I thought I would cover it. Um, so in his question, uh, he goes to say, and I want to quote this because I think it's a, a, good, a good point. Um, if there is a city of Ancapistan near the border of Pharaoh's Egypt, uh, what are the chan what chance is that city going to have if Pharaoh decides to use the resources of his vast tax farm to invade and plunder the Ancap city? I'm hard pressed to imagine how a city could organize a defense without a government, and even harder pressed to imagine how that city could stand a chance if it wasn't in confederation with other cities and towns that were united in common culture and set of values who might send men and materials to aid the city under assault, or in short, without national identity. And then he plugs his video. Uh, he, he made a video talking about it, which I did watch the video. And uh, he talks about both courts and defense. Both are interesting. Both are worth addressing. I'm only going to focus on defense now for the purposes of uh, succinctness. Uh, my videos are long enough as it is. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to not cover uh, law at this point. So right off the bat, the problem with... Uh, the scenario that he outlines is that when we're talking about complex social phenomenon like war and specifically who victors who wins in a war uh we run into the problem that it is uh very difficult if not futile to have true empirical testing of human societies um let's say that we have the pharaonic egypt that we're all familiar with um say population four or five million people uh you know you have the inundation of the nile every year you have a high degree of uh, irrigation you have a fairly regular uh, tax surplus that's allowed every year uh, you have a, a coherent well-established state that's is um you know uh, uh legitimized by religion and by tradition and by a whole slew of other institutions um and you've got maybe four or five million people living in this area you've got an armed uh, a mobilization in terms of their military institutions that could run, you know, maybe a hundred thousand men, something like that. Um, 
and let's say that we have like uh, an anarcho-capitalist area um, and there were no capitalists there wasn't really anything that we could really call capitalism this far back so you know it's not a perfect analogy here but um, you know let's say in uh, in Gaza or in Libya or in Kush one of the surrounding adjacent areas um, of Egypt and we'll say well there's this one anarcho-capitalist city and uh, Pharaoh launches his military forces against the city there's a struggle and uh, Egypt is successful so uh, what Holistic John here is saying is like doesn't I, I imagine that's what would happen and wouldn't that then demonstrate the superiority of states over non-states and I think the answer to that question is no it doesn't demonstrate that because there's a whole host of other variables that could quite plausibly influence victory in that case that aren't necessarily related to the political systems of the various antagonistic entities um, in that case and in the case of most of Egypt's wars with its smaller neighbors you have huge population differences you have huge technological differences you have huge agricultural and economic differences uh, you have huge geographical differences there are the all these factors all of which are very important all of which can be um, decisive in a military struggle whether it be in terms of battle or in terms of a war and yet none of these things are standardized across the test for this to be a fair test we would have to have basically two identical Egypts one with a state and one without a state and have them go to war and see what would happen then and of course that's silly we can't do that test um, you could look at states that on paper in certain variables we find to be relatively similar or not state society so we could say well there's no place in Libya for instance that's going to have the agricultural uh, potential of Egypt there's not there's no place in Libya that's going to have the population potential of, of Egypt or the resources at the disposal of Egypt or or the pot and uh, the same could be said of Gaza or, or most parts of the land but you could say well Mesopotamia they have they have rivers there they have agriculture there they have wealth there different resources uh, not a lot of like mineral resources and I mean Egypt is famous for having lots of stone obviously but you know in the, in the New Kingdom they had a huge abundance of gold um, you know you don't have that in Mesopotamia so even when you find some factors that might be the same there's some others that are huge differences is there a great martial culture you know there's so many uh, variables and I talk about this a lot in my video um, systems analysis in Switzerland in World War two uh, during World War two uh, Germany invaded all of its adjoining states uh, conquered them all regardless you know and yet even though Hitler had very strong antagon antagonistic views towards Switzerland and very strong strategic reasons for occupying the country he never attacked and if you listen to people like Stephen Holbrook or many of the gun gun rights act advocates out there they're going to say well the reason he didn't attack is that all Swiss men and indeed many Swiss Swiss women were armed with uh, rifles and were relatively well trained decent marksmen and that this was a powerful deterrent that prevented the Wehrmacht from attacking Switzerland and that's very true all those reasons exist and they all were factors but then the other there are other factors you could point out well Switzerland is highly mountainous it has the highest mountains in Europe it's it's there's not much of Switzerland that's flat plains and uh, really amenable to the blitzkrieg mechanized warfare that the Wehrmacht was pioneering at this time um, and so you could say well it's because they have mountains now there's problems with that because Yugoslavia has mountains and Norway has mountains and this didn't prevent or, or the Caucasus and these didn't prevent the Germans from launching operations and indeed conquering these areas so it's a very complex question that to then just say well it's probably because the Swiss have a militia system and a canton system that's why they won and not because of mountains and not because of rifle play and, and marksmanship or on and on and on um, it's very very hard to have empirical tests like this if you're going to compare ancient Egypt was which is a uniquely gifted society in terms of its agricultural production especially in the age when technology did not allow for very productive dry farming or, or population centers outside of uh, these uh, very uh, irrigation friendly river valleys it really it's very very hard um, so it, it, it isn't the clear-cut uh, answer that you might think um, and I can think of counterexamples. Uh, if we go to China, for instance, we do have uh, the, this very advanced state-based civilization, or featuring a state. I don't want to say state-based, but a, a society that ha features a state. Uh, you know, in the, in the Yellow River and the Yangtze River valleys, 
and their um, parallel river valleys in China. A well-established, long-established, huge tax base, huge population, uh, and yet not far away and very close, even in, in, in the a same river valley, there's what's called the Great Bend of the Yellow River in this region that's called the Ordos, which is very close to the capital of Beijing today and close to the historic capitals of many of the preceding Chinese states. And yet this area was consistently not ruled by the central state of China, but ruled by nomadic bands of what we would today basically call Mongols. Uh, you know, I think the first records of them in the Qin dynasty refer to them as the who's new. I'm probably saying that wrong, but uh, you know, like this area was settled by these nomadic, presumably stateless, um, you know, nomads. Uh, and not by the state of China. And the state of China many times launched campaigns here. They tried to conquer this area. There are times when they did, and then they would lose the area subsequently for literally thousands of years. Uh, and so there's no clear example here of, uh, or clear superiority of the state vis-a-vis -vis these other cultures. Uh, and you can always come forward and like, oh no, well that's because the Ordos is a semi-arid area and it's difficult for the state to project itself into an area that's semi-arid and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's special pleading though. You can't, whenever a state victor is victorious over a non-state, say, well, the reason is because of its um, political systems and its and so forth, the fact that it has a state. And then whenever a state fails, uh, either def to defend itself or to conquer, to say, well, that's because of some other variable, whether it's climate or geography or martial ability or population or technology or whatever else. Um, I find that there's too many counterexamples that people would have to engage in special pleading all the time. Uh, the two examples that I think are more illustrative are when you have examples of a single state going up against a state and then going up against non-states and seeing how well they do relative to each other. Um, one good example that I've, I've cited many times, and I'll do it again, the Norman conquest of Britain. Uh, you have in Britain in 1066 uh, a fairly well-developed and developing uh, state uh, under Edward the Confessor uh, in what is today England. And then you have much less centralized to the point of being anarchist societies in Ireland, in Wales, and to a lesser extent in Scotland. So if we were to subscribe to the notion that states automatically are superior when it comes to defense, and we look at the UK or what is now the UK, the British Island, Isles, we would say, well, we've got the state in England, and then we have these non-states in Ireland and non-state in Wales and protos, almost non-state in Scotland. So the prediction here is that the state will be able to resist aggression better. Uh, any attacker will probably be more successful in these less centralized, less status, in fact, non-status areas like Wales and, and, and Ireland and Scotland, and less successful in the more statist, more centralized area like England. And we find the complete opposite of that's what happened. Uh, when William the Conqueror invaded England, he won the Battle of Hastings and basically conquered all of England in that fell swoop. Wales and Scotland and Ireland took centuries and centuries and centuries longer to con be, be conquered, literally. Um, and one reason for that and this is something that scholars of the period who aren't coming at this from the angle of trying to determine whether anarcho-capitalism is viable or not or having any kind of libertarian inclinations whatsoever is because you couldn't have a Hastings in Wales, for instance. Uh, there wasn't a single political entity. You couldn't win one battle and then subjugate the entire area. Everywhere you went was a new place. You had to have a new victory. And again, people can special plead here and say, well, Wales is very mountainous and there's lots of rivers that radiate out and it's not very navigable. And yes, yes, that's true, but there's so many other variables. Another good example that I've used before is the conquest of the New World. If we look in the Western Hemisphere uh, when Columbus landed and in the subsequent uh, 16th, 17th centuries, you have a wide variety of societies, some of which are stateless, almost completely decentralized, all the way up to sophisticated, highly regimented authoritarian states, like you have, uh, say, with the Aztec or with the Inca. And yet, if we look at this from the perspective, all these societies are different. The, the more status ones were in more subtle areas. They had larger populations. They had more explicit militaries. Uh, they were much more centralized. And you would look at this map of North and South America, and you would say, gosh, 
when the Europeans arrive, obviously the Europeans have advantages in technologies and, and, and whatnot, um, but they're going to have greater advantages relative to these um, decentralized uh, stateless societies, say like the Plains Indians or uh, the Indians in the Northeast of the United States or the Southeast of the United States or in the Caribbean relative to states like the Aztec state or, or the Inca state. Since those are states and since they can uh, coerce cooperation, since they can uh, um, draft people and since they can tax people and since they can f have these, these military institutions, not identical to the in military institutions that you and I would recognize, but still state uh, institutions of war, but, uh, with all the political hierarchy and, and that goes with it, that they would be able to resist uh, these invaders more effectively than, than, than the less centralized and, in fact, anarchist societies. And we don't find that. Um, we find that the state societies in Mexico and, and the Inca collapsed very, very quickly. Um, and it's actually fascinating. And I don't know as much about the Inca, but in the case of the Mexicans, um, Cortes wasn't actually a state. Cortes was not appointed by the Spanish crown. Uh, he wasn't fighting on their behalf. He tried to legitimize his conquest by appealing to them. And I think he realized that ultimately he would not be able to resist them had they wanted to assert themselves purposely. Although there, there is evidence that he considered basically becoming a kingmaker in his own right. But Conquistadors were private contractors. They were people who had contracts with Cortes. He borrowed money from private lenders to launch this effect. He actually went against the wishes of the highest government officials in Cuba at the time. I believe his name was Governor Grivalda. Uh, so in this we have a case of a what could very easily be considered a stateless mercenary band conquering a state. Um, something that we can actually find repeated in history many times. Now I'm not going to say, well, this proves that, you know, uh, private mercenaries and uh, anarchist uh, militaries are superior to state ones. No, because you could always, you could point out all the other different variables. They have more technology. Uh, they have the, these things with disease where they have immunity, to all these diseases that are going to ravage, you know, the Native Americans. But uh, be that as it may, it, clearly uh, the... The status paradigm, the status, um, not just the status paradigms, the status predictions about who would best who in the, these um, conflicts, which, which societies would resist the Spanish better, or later the English or the French or whoever else, it should be the more status ones. It should be the, the and, and especially these large, with millions of people, highly centralized, long history states. And yet, that's not what, that's not what happened at all. These states were conquered very quickly. Uh, uh, and relatively easily uh, by, in the case of Cortez, basically non-state mercenaries. Uh, and we can see this repeated in North America, uh, in, in the Great Lakes, the societies that were more centralized collapsed much faster than the societies that were less centralized. Um, the tribes, if you want to call them that, that had uh, more developed chieftains and chiefdoms, you know, that were more closer to states or proto-states than some of the other ones, they all went by, they all died faster. They were all defeated more quickly uh, than the more decentralized uh, societies were. And again, but none of these are, are textbook cases where we can isolate a, a single variable. They all were geographically isolated. They were uh, uh, teleologically isolated at different time periods. The factors affecting the Europeans when they were fighting were very different at different times. So there isn't a clear-cut answer here. It's, it's way too easy to cherry-pick and to special plead your way to getting the answer that you want. Um, but if you're honest with it, you don't see this. And we can even, even today, you know, if you look at the U.S. military going to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, well, Iraq had a powerful central state, you know, with a huge military and a dictator and blah, 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 blah. And Afghanistan, even with the Taliban, really lacked that. And yet, was there a huge difference in the ability of the two to resist? Uh, no. Um, in fact, Afghanistan is almost completely unsubduable. Uh, regardless of how many forces you penetrate there. And again, you could special pleading, go, well, that's not because they don't have a state, that's because they have mountains and everything. I'm like, well, fair enough, that's a fair point. Uh, but again, special pleading. You can't, you can't say, well, Egypt conquered Libya, ergo states are always better. You know, and, and even in that case, Libya conquered Egypt. Uh, many of the pharaohs of Egypt that you'll see on display are Libyans. Because Libya conquered Egypt, uh, just as the Mongols 
the many times i mean Mongo mongolian history is a long period so i won't characterize the whole thing as being all stateless or all non-state but vastly more decentralized often without anything that could really be called a state and at time at one point at least they completely conquered china you know when marco polo went to china kublai khan the emperor of china was not chinese he was genghis khan's great grandson or whatever uh so and there's many actually in history many examples of uh nomads or pastoralists coming into agricultural societies and just taking them over and so you'll have like a settled society say in babylon that has a state that's ruled by babylonian kings and all this and then shepherds basically from the uh, iranian plateau or from anatolia or wherever else will sweep in and you know we don't know very much about these peoples necessarily so we can't say that they were or were not stateless or to what degree or or, or other but clearly less centralized clearly less numerous and yet they still take over you know martial ability can count for a lot if you have people who are able to fight willing to fight have the grit for it have the knack for it and you have people who aren't it really doesn't matter if they have a, a king or not uh, the king of sheep is still going to lose to you know the uh, anarcho-capitalist band of wolves uh, and or at least hypothetically it could end up being that way so i think that this this uh empirically is something that is i think impossible to demonstrate one way or the other there's enough examples either way that an argument can be made uh either way now he also raises an interesting point i haven't heard too many people kind of look at it this way but they say look let's say we have the united states is anarcho-capitalist anarcho, anarcho capitalist there's no state in the united states and let's assume that the rest of the world still has its states and for ease of uh you know argumentation they're the states that we have today so we'd have canada we'd have mexico everybody else would be the same well let's say that mexico decides it wants to take back the lands that uh you know it believes belong to it because at one point it used they used to and so they launch an invasion of texas and arizona and california um and the argument is made well it may very well be the case that people there in texas and california and arizona would resist the mexicans um, and if we're talking hypothetically, if we're talking the relative populations and um, uh, like technological abilities, I think that in that scenario today, I think that Texas and California and Arizona and New Mexico would be perfectly capable of defending themselves against Mexico. But let's just assume that they get attacked and those people are unable to effectively defend themselves on their own. The argument could be made well. An advantage of the state is that the state can go to people in maine and new hampshire and michigan and alaska and all these other areas that are not directly being attacked and it can marshal either that manpower uh, through conscription or their resources through taxation to help defend that area so people in maine and new hampshire and new york will be uh, co coerced either through taxation or conscription to aid in the defense of these other people living on the border with mexico even though they're not directly threatened and that this will enhance the defense of 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 the southern border so to speak uh this is a very interesting argument and i think it it fails because it makes a few assumptions that i think are unsupportable it's an open question whether it's actually ethical or desirable to go to those people and say you should be coerced for the defense of others all right it's a bit arbitrary to say that the people in New Hampshire and Maine and New York should be coerced to help with the defense of people in Arizona and Texas, but then not to say that they should be coerced for the defense of people in, say, Africa or Asia or Australia or any, any place else for that matter. Um, if somebody in the Northeast says, I really don't have a dog in this fight, I really don't care um, whether uh, Arizona or Texas is anarcho-capitalist or whether it's part of the Mexican state, either way i may have a, i may have an opinion i may have a preference but that preference doesn't rise to the level that i'm willing to say go and fight or pay 10 percent taxes or whatever it is um the status argument assumes that that response that the person in maine or new york or whatever um that argues that it assumes that that is incorrect and that the correct answer is that that person ought to be coerced 
and forced to help in the defense of somebody else. And I think that's just an assumption that you make that's not really supported by anything. Now, if it's a, if there's, now there's reasons to think that people might defend. I mean, it totally, people can have cultural affinity, they can have, uh, uh, they can have ideological affinity, they can go and look, oh, I don't like what's happening in Spain, I don't like that the fascists are taking over, I'm going to go and help fight against the fascists, and I'm going to join the Lincoln Brigade or whatever, and go to Spain, which thousands of Americans did that in, in, during the Spanish Civil War, just as one example. Um, would it have been right, though, for them to go and say, let's have let's a draft and send people there? Uh, I think the answer is probably no, and the question arises, why is it not you know what's the what's the non-arbitrary difference between sending people to defend Arizona and sending people to defend Spain? Uh, and I don't think there's a good answer for that. Um, so I, I you can't just oh it's it's you can't say it's superior because it's going to create these massive rights violations that are ethically questionable and, and not efficacious from the point of view of anyone who's being coerced to help in something they don't want to help in because it's because it is beneficial to the people who are going to get extra defense. Yeah, it is. I mean, the people in Arizona and Texas, they'll benefit because people in New England are getting taxed and conscripted to help them. Sure, they will. But then that's the case of, uh, you know, uh, rent-seeking, and that as long as the government is helping somebody, then it can coerce anybody, right? You know, we can... Why, that doesn't end at defense. We can just say, oh, well, uh, sure, you don't go to public school, and you, don't, you send your kids to private school, or you don't have kids, but... You know, we're going to take your money and we're going to use it to help people on welfare, help people in school, or help whatever else, help uh, the Saudi Arabian government or the Israeli government or the uh, dictator in Egypt or whatever else. And it's all justifiable by very similar logic. Um, you know, if someone decide, and and there's even a more fundamental thing. What if somebody in, in Arizona or in Texas goes, look, I don't like Mexico, but I'm not willing to defend it. Like, I'm not, I don't care enough that I'm going to fight against them. Is that the wrong answer? Again, this kind of assumes that the right answer is always to resist violently. And frankly, that may not be the case. Uh, and who, who are we to tell someone? I mean, it's one thing to persuade someone or to suggest to somebody, hey, maybe that's not the best, best approach. It's another thing altogether to go and say, I'm going to coerce you and punish you with the power uh, of the government if you don't actively assist me. Uh, there's a much higher burden of proof when we're talking about what's philosophically okay or ethically or morally okay uh, between the two. And even if deontology doesn't get your goat, uh, what's going to have the, the utilitarian consequences of giving some institution the ability to enact that coercion, whether it be through taxation or conscription or both, as it practically would almost always be, uh, is enormous. All right. The, the practical implications of that far, far exceed defense or non-defense. All right. So, uh, I think that this is, is very problematic. Yeah. You, you're, you're setting up to where you assume that the anarcho-capitalism has to act exactly like the state was. The, there has to be a way to make people from Maine and New England go to the Southern border to fight the Mexicans. Uh, and if it doesn't do that, then it's a failure. And I think that that's not true. Um, if people in New York and New England think and I just am using that as an example, um, that that the aggression of Mexico against Texas, anarcho-capitalist Texas, uh, is a threat to them, then they will probably support it to some degree. And if they think it's a serious threat, probably to a great deal. If they don't think it's a big deal, if they don't think it's that serious of a threat to them or to the people in Texas, if they don't have that affinity, then it's a very open question whether they should be forced to do so in the first place. Um, you know, we could very... and and. You know, if we look at World War II, for instance, that's one where it's very easy to pick sides and be like, yeah, I like side A and not side B. Uh, but then that's a very different question of should we join the fight? You know, you might say you don't like Assad and you don't like ISIS. Maybe you like Assad more than you like ISIS. That doesn't mean that you have to go fight for him or that you should force people to go fight for him or to support him in some other way. Um, and I think that's that's a very basic kind of conceit that people have that... Uh, it would have to duplicate that. I don't think that it does. I think, um, yes, that does provide certain challenges, but it also uh, has the benefit of not aggressing against extra people, uh, of 
making it more free, which I think tends to make it more wealthy. Uh, you have a situation uh, where it is harder from the Mexican point of view to say, oh, um, I mean, the other thing is like this stuff like this doesn't happen in a vacuum. So it wouldn't be like an arco Stan is fine and everything's great. And then one day just hordes of enemies just pour across the borders. Where do these hordes of enemies come from? Who, how, how are such vast sums of people mobilized? Um, you know, something like that takes time. All right. If, it, it's pretty clear that some, there's a buildup that's going to happen. And that gives whoever is the potential victim of that time to consider what best to do and how to organize to defend themselves. To what degree, in what ways. Um, the lack of a state also robs the attacking force of a lot of the, the, like, okay, who's the evil enemy here? It's just a society up there. They don't have a state. They don't have a king. They don't have a military. So what's the threat? You know, it's, it's ubiquitous all through history for states to basically point to whoever they're attacking as a threat to us. And r removing that um, propaganda tool is very important. Maybe not decisive in all cases, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but uh, it's very important. Uh, it's to always admit that you're the aggressor vis-a-vis -vis anarcho-capitalism. Now, actually, I think that's true in propaganda purposes. I don't think that's true in all purposes, because I think anarcho-capitalism could be aggressive. I think anarcho-capitalists could have mercs for hire that could go around taking over other areas. Uh, now, that would setting up their own little states. I know that um, maybe is a contradiction, but I definitely think it would be possible. We actually have histories of that. In fact, if we're talking about the United States, Americans used to do this quite a bit. Uh, Americans used to go to get together, form little private clubs, and then go and take over South American countries like Nicaragua or Cuba, uh, or in a sort of a way, sort of Texas. Um, you know, uh, and if we go back in history, the Romans used to do this. The first Punic War basically started but with a group of Romans just going and taking over a city in Sicily, saying, like, this is going to be our, our, our little society now. Uh, we have more martial ability. You know, we can go and just take the city. And, uh, yeah, I actually think you could see stuff like that happening. But you wouldn't have, like, a, a central Leviathan that, you know, the Mexican government can go, like, oh, we need to stop them because they're going to take over all of Mexico. Um, so there's no boogeyman. Uh, there's no central state that can capitulate. You know, the problem, you have a good example of France. You know, France, powerful central state, long established, you know, oiled, uh, very thoughtful, you know, uh, class of technicians and, and whatnot who, who work to make it effective, a very long, successful military history. And yet, twice in the course of less than 100 years, uh, utterly defeated by an adjacent state. And... You know, it's for some reason, you know, if, if a, a stateless society gets conquered by a state, it's considered well, that proves anarcho-capitalism can, or, you know, a stateless society can never defeat a state. But then when a state gets defeated by a state, it's thought to prove nothing at all. It proves that states can be really shitty at defense, uh, and often are. Um, and if you look in the, in the case of France, say you have the Franco-Prussian War in 1871 and uh, the Second World War, in 1940, really, when France got invaded, uh, you had millions and millions of Frenchmen who wanted to resist and were able to resist and have the potential to resist who were deprived of that because their states cap capitulated. Um, the Franco-Prussian War especially, there's a really good book called The Franco-Prussian War, which I, I encourage people to read. The armies of, of metropolitan France were defeated on the field uh, almost without major conflict by the Prussian army. In that war and the state was basically robbed of its of its military but the populace of france was not defeated and they continued to resist quite effectively um, against the germans who did not have really the infrastructure structure to to combat this guerrilla war now eventually the french government surrendered and the war ended but before that happened the prussian military was actually having such huge logistical problems that bismarck was starting to advocate that they have to find a way to end the war any even without a capitulation, just because it's so difficult to subdue all these, you know, um, Frenchmen who are acting basically on their own, own recognizance. Um, and there's many, many examples of this through uh, the history of guerrilla warfare that I think are a testament to the effectiveness uh, and one of the chief virtues of these uh, less centralized and indeed stateless resistance is that you don't have a central authority to give up the game, to fuck everything up. Uh, the Civil War actually is a good example of this.
um, where you have limited manpower on the part of the South, and yet what does the government do? It concentrates all that manpower in a few large armies, and then they get bled to death. And the South runs out of manpower without defending all the thousands and thousands of little valleys and hills and rivers and crossings and areas that would have... I mean, the, the North would have had to garrison more than a million soldiers throughout the South, but they didn't have to do that because, you know, Jeff Davis and all these West Point-educated military people uh, from the South created these giant Napoleonic field armies, and they gave them, I mean, granted to brilliant commanders like Robert E. Lee, but they go and they just bleed the South dry on fucking, you know, cornfields in Pennsylvania and Northern Virginia. And so they didn't have to go and root out every southern secessionist out of every you know, nook and cranny of the South, which would have been, frankly, impossible. Um, and I think that that's a really important lesson that is just not learned by people. If history is so focused on, on the big battles in the states that people get this myopia, they're like, that's all that matters, and that's all that works, and that all, that's all that count. And not to deny that those things aren't important, or don't matter, they do. They are important, they can be critically important, but they're not all that matters. There's a lot that goes on that, even if it's in the books, it's not emphasized. Uh, and I think that's a good example of that. So, yeah, I think it, it, you can't just assume that uh, forcing people to support uh, the defense of others uh, is necessarily a virtue. It's not. Um, does it have advantages? Sure. Does it have disadvantages? Yeah. And, you know, the empirical record doesn't really speak, I don't think, very strongly one way or another. Um I think there's too many counterexamples and there's too many other variables to be so conclusive. And, and you know, it's one thing to say I'm not really sure. It's another thing to say I'm sure states will always, uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, states are, technology I think is a two-edged sword and I don't want to predict too much of what it will entail, but it's it's totally invisible. It is totally possible to see that technology could render it considerably less uh effective than it currently is now it could make it more effective too it depends how it plays out um but and, and i do think that technology at some point did make the states more uh more effective uh for a time uh certain technologies anyway so anyway that's that's kind of my answer there uh, also some of you may notice that i uh, uploaded some videos um that were blank, but that I'm, I'm working on getting, uh, so I can do hangouts so that I can interview people and, and maybe do some live Q and a things. I wanted to do that for a while. Um, I think I have everything that I need. I just haven't gotten the right, uh, you know, uh, programs and stuff, but I am working on that. Uh, Ivan the Heathen and I talked about doing a video. I like the idea. He posted a long comment on one of my videos and I didn't want to I hate typing long comment responses that I know that almost any no one's going to see. Uh, I like the idea of having uh, video replies where people go back and forth. It kind of reminds me of the old days on YouTube when people had long dialogues like that. I, I think that was a good thing. Um, and while the video reply function isn't there, people can still make videos directed towards each other. Uh, but I thought it would be kind of cool just to actually, maybe not interview, but just have a discussion with him and maybe other people too. So uh, look for that in the next couple weeks. It's only a question of me taking the time to figure out how to make it work, and then it will probably happen. But um, anyway, cool. So I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.